Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, edition of the Co-Management Commons podcast. Really excited to introduce you to Dr. Rachel Cadman, who's a brand new PhD graduate from Dalhousie University. And I got the pleasure of meeting Rachel over the past uh, four to five years as she's been uh, doing work in the Nanatsiavut region. And I had the pleasure of co-supervising her as a PhD student along with uh, Dr. Megan Bailey within the Marine Affairs Program at Dalhousie University. So her work involved uh, visioning the future of the fishery in the Nazivut, and she worked with the co-management board in the region, as well as all of the other fisher stakeholders in our neck of the woods. And at the time of this recording, she was back in Labrador presenting her results at our annual fisheries workshop. So Rachel, uh, thank you for coming on to the Co-Management Commons podcast and really happy to have you as a guest and uh, full disclosure for people that will listen to this that uh, I was uh, Rachel's PhD co-supervisor for the last four years or so over the COVID <laughs> period and uh, had the pleasure of working quite a lot with Rachel. But uh, most importantly, all of your work was done in a co-management context. So that's why I was really hopeful that we could share more about your project in this format. And uh, with that, a uh, big congratulations. I know you just recently went to convocation and had the fancy robes on and <laughs> and uh, got right to the finish line. So congratulations with that. Thank you. Yeah, Dalhousie's robes are, are uh, black and bright yellow, so <laughs> it's a pretty dramatic. <laughs> Yeah, I think all the universities are dramatic that way. It looks like a little bit like dress up day, but uh, no, it was uh, really cool to see you uh, or the pictures that I saw knowing that it did take so long to do a PhD and it is more like a marathon. Like when uh, when did you first start coming to Labrador? Like, um, I'd done like a literature review um, as a short research contract that was sort of gathering all published information about um, really new Nazi, but a little bit sort of broader Labrador um, that was sort of environmentally focused literature. So I had this kind of removed familiarity uh, with the region, but the first time I came up was like day two of the PhD. I think I was there on like May 2nd or something like that. And I started on May 1st. So it was pretty much right away. <laughs> nice. Well, why don't we start by, if you, if you could just tell us a bit about yourself, like who is Rachel Cadman? And and uh, I know you wrote a positionality statement. So just maybe even if you could go into that a bit about who you are and how you relate it to all of this research. Well, I'm a, I'm a white woman uh, from Guelph, Ontario, originally. Um, that's where I grew up. Uh, and I moved out to Halifax to do an undergrad back in like 2008 or 2009. Uh, and I've been out in, in Halifax ever since uh, doing my work. Uh, and when I came out to Halifax, I did an undergrad uh, at the University of King's College. Um, which is like a liberal arts school. Uh, so sort of a, a little bit different from what I do now, um, more sort of philosophy kind of focused um, and, and history focused. Uh, but and eventually I came back and did grad school. I did a, a master's of resource and environmental management. Uh, and when I was doing that, I sort of encountered natural science for the first time, kind of felt like a bit of an outsider um, and found science. I mean, you know, when it's being taught really simply and kind of broadly can, can be really dogmatic. Um, 
there's a right answer and a wrong answer to a lot of questions. And coming from a different background, I was really surprised uh, at, at how strict those lines could be and how black and white things seemed. And so I was interested in questions around like what types of information and whose information matters. So that kind of took me into the work that I did in my master's and then looking at the PhD, kind of trying to think more about how do we value different types of information and and where it comes from and the people who are communicating it and all those types of questions, which leads to a lot of stuff around equity and justice, right? And, and the people that we privilege uh, in terms of listening to them as as providing real or true information. That's really interesting because most people that I talk to about co-management, it seems like they're trained in the natural sciences and often in a situation where we're trying to convince them that the social sciences or liberal arts are really important also when it comes to fish and wildlife co-management. And I hadn't thought about it from the other way around it seems a lot more rare and like given your liberal arts education at king's college what do you think you brought to the to your research and then i see but from that background that really benefited you and, and the work i mean it's, it's classic of a liberal arts graduate to say that critical thinking is an important skill <laughs> um, but that definitely uh, played into it uh, having that sort of um, critical lens on things from the outset, I think, was really important to kind of questioning some of those um, generally thought of being unquestionable uh, things. Um, so that definitely was helpful. It's difficult to find a space uh, when you're coming from the other side because most people, the expectation is coming from natural sciences uh, into the sort of policy or social science world. Yeah, I don't know why it only works one way. I think sometimes like social science methods and things like that can seem easier to learn and adopt than trying to backtrack and go the other way. But I don't think that's necessarily true. So I think that um, I had a level of, of training and, and thinking about things in a certain way that you know came in handy. Well, you definitely hit the ground running when you started. And maybe we could talk about that a little bit on day two you're already in Labrador uh, what did that look like and and who did you meet and how did you get going so quickly maybe we could just give a bit of context of of uh, what your research project was I was able to start quickly because uh, you as my supervisor and my other supervisor Megan Bailey had already kind of met and conceptualized a lot of stuff around um, the questions that could be asked um, around sort of what the future of fisheries, uh, commercial fisheries might look like for the next year. So you sort of had some ideas already in mind and had also done a lot of legwork in terms of kind of pitching those ideas or growing those ideas with uh, other people who eventually became partners on the project. So uh, I was able to kind of get in there on day two of the PhD and start hosting a couple of meetings out of the, the Torngat Secretariat building um, where we could discuss uh, some of the sort of practicalities of what that research would look like, which doesn't often happen, I think, with a PhD to, to get that sort of level of kind of research infrastructure already built for you uh, so that. Um, helped a lot. In terms of what I did on, on day two and all of that, I think I came in and, and met um, people over at the Secretariat building, co-management board uh, offices, really generally, because when you're on day two of your PhD, you have no idea what you're doing, <laughs> but kind of pitch some general ideas and thoughts that we all had together. Uh, and then we brought in uh, some other potential partners in the New Nazi government, um, Land and Natural Resources Department, and the uh, fish, the Torngat Fish Co-op, um, as people who might be interested in, in participating in that project and having some sort of creative control over that as well. So that was sort of the really early stage. And I wonder if part of 
your training in the liberal arts made it so easy for you to be adaptable and come into a project where there were some ideas already starting to be conceived. You're talking about it like it's really natural, but it's not always the case that people are as flexible as that. Sometimes it's been our experience. People will have very structured research ideas and they're already pitching their proposal when they hit the ground on day two. And it's just fundamentally a different frame of mind and shift. So uh, I think the, you being able to conceptualize how this was different and identify what some of the advantages were going to be are probably easy to overlook and and understand that those were really really great strengths too that you brought to the work i guess why don't we talk about that like you did a very unique uh, phd in the sense that it was very forward looking and looking to the future and this is something that i know in our co-management situation we hadn't done very much of and i don't think it's necessarily the norm most people think of Inuit knowledge and traditional knowledge and all the other variations on the terms as looking backwards. But this work was very much trying to vision the future of Inuit fisheries in the Nasivut. So why don't you take us through how you did that and, and where we got to. Let's try to explore and share a little bit about the methods that you use and ultimately articulate what the vision is now because uh, it has to be implemented now at this stage. So the original uh, plan or the original kind of gap that I think um, the those three partner organizations saw for the commercial fishing industry was that things had been sort of piecemeal um, because, you know, there'd be big issues happening in the fishery that needed to be resolved and capacity was quite low in terms of like management. So those sort of long-term strategies for the future and actually sitting down as a group and thinking about what the fishery means to people and what they want it to mean to the future hadn't really made it into, um, you know, where everybody was at in their, in their day-to-day -day management. Uh, so part of the idea of the project was just to give an opportunity for everybody to have that time to think more creatively um, and openly about what the future could look like. So we ended up using a kind of like stage staged approach so we had a bunch of, of different kind of data collection that we did over the course of a couple of years uh, to make sure that people sort of had a chance to think through and, and criticize their the ideas and then sort of remold them into um, an idea for the future so we used uh, a method that's called target seeking scenario planning uh, which is about thinking about the future and particularly thinking about like ideal or desirable futures. So you're you're kind of aiming for uh, a, a perfect situation, a perfect goal rather than kind of uh, modeling potential um, real futures. Uh, so it's sort of your perfect idea. And we did it in three stages. I did interviews with uh, commercial fishers and fisheries managers um, throughout Nunatse, but um, and spoke to them about kind of how they see the fisheries today, barriers that they face, the things that they want to see down the line, but sort of really generally um, ideas that people had for the future. And once I had this kind of big list of, of ideas, I brought them back to managers and to fishers to do like a ranking exercise where they could say, well, these ideas are really important or these ideas are less important or they won't happen for 10 years. So I'm not going to pay attention to them and all that kind of thing. Uh, and we sort of narrowed down these specific ideas, or I guess we didn't so much narrow them down as we started to see some sort of bigger trends in the things that, that people really cared about in the fishery. So uh, it gave us an opportunity to look at these kind of big, higher level themes uh, of things that people wanted to see. So they saw the fisheries as contributing to uh, community well-being, uh, 
uh, contributing to economic development for Nunaziovit, uh, sustainable development. So they're talking about sort of that, that um, maintaining that connection to the environment and monitoring and those types of things. Uh, and so sort of a governance lens as well. So a political lens. They actually saw uh, engagement in the commercial fishing industry as being important for sort of asserting Nunaziovit uh, territorial rights over the marine space. So we had these kind of big, big ideas for why the fisheries are important and what people sort of wanted to see in the future. So then once we had these big themes, we brought together a smaller group of managers who are all partners on the project from the co-management board, uh, the Torngat uh, Fish Co-op, and the Nunaziba government to think through, well, in practice, what does it mean to have economic development? What types of envelop- development would we want to invest in? So we had we had a workshop where those those uh, partner organizations could talk through, in practice, what those uh, big goals would look like. Uh, and so from that, we kind of developed what we call a vision of the future for Nunaziovit. Nice. And was it, out of curiosity, was it hard in the interviews to get some of the fishers to think about the future? Because I, I know prior to this work, we'd always talked about, like, what happened last summer. Uh, it's really hard not to get bogged down on what some of the challenges are. But when you were doing the interviews, did it take much effort to get them reoriented to the fishery in 10, 20, 30 years from now? Yeah, I mean, I think especially uh, in the early parts of the interview, and even when people are doing the ranking, there's sort of a natural tendency to, A, complain about the current barriers that you're facing, right? Because those things are immediate and in your face. And then to be given a suggestion for a potential solution. So one of the things we talked about was should we build um, a shrimp plant, say, somewhere in along the coast of Nunaziovit, which would mean that shrimp could be processed within the region. But the natural tendency is for people to kind of say, um, oh, well, that's not possible. Or you would need X, Y, and Z to happen before we would actually get to the point where we'd be able to build Um, that shrimp processing plant. So I'm not going to prioritize that because I don't see it happening in the near future. Uh, So definitely that was was a big setback when it came to doing the rankings to try to get people to move beyond sort of a dependency-based idea of the future to just an idealized perfect world. I don't think we really got to that until we had the workshop. And it kind of clicked for the people, the managers in that room to say, oh, we can really kind of think about anything. <laughs> like we can really throw it all on the wall, right? And I think that that, um, that was really positive, but it took until then to really uh, kick that up. Out of the early interviews with Fishers, I probably I heard much more about sort of what they think a successful fishery would look like um, in a hypothetical world or what the most successful fisheries are, and then use those kinds of questions to kind of extrapolate about what a desirable, you know, version of the fisheries would look like. So with uh, with that uh, workshop, maybe, maybe we could just talk a little bit about that. I know that was a year ago, and we're excited that you'll be coming back soon to share all your results and stuff. But, but uh, I remember being at the workshop and was really interesting to be getting positive feedback about being in a fisheries workshop. It's just not always that way when people are dealing with stressful uh, fishing issues, but this idea that you got people to that, okay, we can actually dream a little bit here seem mm-hmm. to kind of change the tone and mood a bit, but maybe we could just talk about the the workshop and what you did there. Yeah, I think, so the workshop, I can't remember the exact number of people that we had. We did it over the course of three days. So we took, I want to say we took the mornings and then the, the bigger fisheries workshop took the afternoons. But we, so it was three kind of half days to do uh, this workshop with this group of 10 to 12 
fisheries managers, all of whom have been working together for many, many years, um, but who ha don't usually have the opportunity to talk to each other about some of these things. And so what I wanted to kind of start us off with after I sort of presented on the first couple of um, rounds of data collections, I presented on the findings and the big themes. Uh, and then I wanted to prompt a conversation about successes and kind of ask people to share their stories of um, when a time that they thought that the fisheries had been successful or, or something that they were really proud of about the industry, uh, just to give us this idea of these kind of seeds of success. So these moments um, that we saw as, as a positive thing in the commercial fishery, because like you say, it's really easy to get bogged down in some of the difficult to deal with issues or the conflicts or the, the immediate things that are facing you. So um, I have I face a little bit of resistance at the beginning to just talking about positive stories. Uh, I think some <laughs> there was some hope in that room that we might actually this might be an opportunity to hash out some of the <laughs> problems. <Grievances? laughs> yeah, yeah, some of the grievances exactly. Um, but I think you know I share I pulled some out of earlier um, interviews that I'd done, so I I pulled out some of those stories and we talked through some of those so that the fisheries had. Um, uh, contributed to the community freezer program during COVID, for example, and how successful that had been in ensuring that the, the communities had more access to seafood, and food security, and really food sovereignty because of, of that effort. Um, and so we talked about the importance of, of contributing to community well-being through the fisheries and, and a couple more of those kind of stories that got people to really think about sort of why the fisheries are important to Nunatsi of it. Uh, and then we moved into breakout groups from there. Uh, and the breakout groups were an opportunity. So we had these kind of stories from the past on day one, and then stories about the future for day two. So the breakout groups were each assigned one of those sort of high level values. So uh, economic development, community well-being, sustainability, and political autonomy. Uh, and they were asked to kind of come up with a fictionalized commercial fisheries industry that was managed to meet the goal of, say, community well-being. And so that kind of required people to start to define, well, what does community well-being mean? And what could we do with the fishing industry to try to manage for it? So what would need to change? What sort of institutions would we need to put in place or fund? Uh, so once we had these kind of four individual stories, everyone came back to to share those stories with one another um, and that and then kind of discuss them and, and think about uh, what was really important um, or what kind of trade offs they saw in between the stories and that kind of thing. Uh, and the big the first sort of big thing that came out of that discussion was the idea that, you know, 50 years in the future, the fishery would be managed 100% by Nunatsiavut. And so there is this sort of pie in the sky ideal um, picture of Nunatsiavut having control, like management control over quotas adjacent to the region. Um, and it, this was, that was a really good moment, I think, for sort of it clicked for people this um, this sort of why an idealized version of the future, or like you said, like that you can really dream um, was a good thing. And uh, I think someone had originally said 75% of the fisheries uh, will be run by your Nazi or uh, have access uh, by your Nazi uh, And then when they heard other people had said 100, they said, oh, well, forget mine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for a hundred. <laughs> Might as well. Uh, but it does give this kind of, it was this sort of strength building exercise, I think, for people to think about, oh, like, what would we, what do we really want? And what could we do with it if we had it? Um, so that was, that was a really cool moment. So that, that came out as being uh, sort of essential to people, uh, that idea of access to adjacent quotas. Uh, and then there was also what another one that came out really strongly was the idea that you know, we acknowledge 
should be used to manage the fishery. So on equal levels with Western science, people wanted to see knowledge being used in sort of monitoring and decision-making processes. Nice. It's interesting that you were able to identify some points where you've seen light bulbs going off or mm. clicks happening. Well, did it happen that way for you too, in a way that it, it wasn't until the workshop or were, or were you kind of seeing things uh, clicking throughout the course of doing the interviews and, and so on? You know, I, I was a, being a PhD student, so I had a really idealized, really positive idea of like how well it was going to go and how important <laughs> it would be to people and all of that kind of thing. So at the very beginning, I think I was, I saw it as be as like that potential for it. And then, you know, once you get into the morass of collecting data and analyzing it and trying to, you know, convince people to think positively <laughs> and stuff like that, there was a while where I was struggling to kind of find that narrative again and to see it as something that was going to be that helpful to people. So I think even though it was sort of the intention of the workshop to bring people to that kind of empowering, strength-building place, it was still a surprise when it happened uh, by the time that we got there. So I think, yeah, from that that perspective, I think... Uh, I was I was seeing those light bulbs go off for people, and that was really exciting to watch. So one of the things I know you did in one paper, and I, I should mention you've done a really exceptional job getting a number of papers now published from your chapters. So congratulations on that, and it's really cool that they're all open access publications. So I'll certainly put links to all of them in the podcast details so people can check all of those out and get more details on the methods in particular and and some of the results and so on and I know that you captured some of your results visually by working with an Inuit artist and now thinking about the liberal arts uh, background <laughs> that's probably uh, makes sense now in hindsight but I'm just kind of curious what that process looked like working with the artist and and how all that came to be. Yeah, there was a lot of sort of creative storytelling and um, sort of art-based methods that I really wanted to be part of the process. But I myself am not a talented artist. Um, but Jess, Jessica Winters, uh, who is an Inuk artist, she's in St. John's now, but she's from Makovic. I had worked with her on something else before and, and know how fantastic um, she is at kind of bringing stories to life. Um, and so I wanted to work with her again to kind of have a different way of, of thinking about this stuff. Because, you know, like you say, uh, I've got, we've published papers on some of this stuff, but publishing a paper in academic language um even though, you know, in that room, in that workshop, it's really exciting and the energy is there. I think once you put it in an academic document, it, it loses a lot of that um, juice. It looks so inspiring, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So part of it was to, yeah, kind of get that visual representation and, and try to show some of that, like, positivity and, and motivation that came out of that space. So Jess got given copies of the stories that were generated during that workshop. So she got, there were four stories from the four themes. And then we'd worked as a group on sort of summarizing one uh, overarching vision. And so she got um, those sort of five stories uh, given to her. She read through them and then she and I talked a bit about sort of what were the most important parts of those to her, kind of what stuck out about them. And she tried a few different sort of designs and then came up with four illustrations for the four stories and then kind of a piece that, that brings together a, a map of Nunaziabut with um, uh, some administrative building, the administrative building in, in Hopedale, the government office, and, uh, and a fishing boat um, to kind of marry the whole piece together. So we had 
we developed this kind of big, I don't know what it would be like, sectioned um, painting that she did for us uh, based on the vision. And I think that that provides like another level um, to understanding what that vision is kind of about. Is there anything that you learned about co-management through all of this work that you did that you feel is important to share now looking back at it? I think that um, one thing about the new Nazi of commercial fishing industry is that there's a co-management board uh, that is sort of a literal organization of people who do co-management for fisheries, but that there's this quite large ecosystem that includes a lot of other um, players who contribute to the overall management of uh, fisheries. And that is so much more complicated and sort of has all these little pockets to it um, that makes, that uh, does a lot to kind of enrich how people interact with the fisheries, but can also make it really difficult to manage and to think about sort of some of those long-term questions. So that definitely, that sort of bigger definition of co-management that I think sometimes we don't uh, think about, um, in at least in, in academic spaces, I think is, is really important to consider when we, when we study it. Yes, a lot broader and fuzzier than <laughs> it looks when you just yeah. read the black and white of the <laughs> land claim agreement in this case. Yes. Yeah. And I remember when you, uh, just to s switch gears a little bit, the uh, because uh, what I really like about everything that you did with the workshop was very practical working with the fishers and and curious to just switch over to the theoretical a little bit because when you were examined uh, for your PhD, that was uh, really well done and it was really great that you had uh, Dr. Deborah McGregor as your examiner and she's certainly very well known for her thoughts and writing when it comes to indigenous knowledge and environmental governance and equity and indigenous methods and so on and kind of interested in your thoughts of uh in your reflections on the questions that she asked and and what was your experience there and did it change any of your thinking with the project yeah, I think one of the things that sort of started to come out at the end of the thesis was around um, whether sort of our definitions of co-management are enough to account for Inuit knowledge systems or Indigenous knowledge systems more generally. So where management has that kind of day-to-day um, -day decision-making angle, it doesn't really account for some of the things that, you know, Deborah McGregor has defined about Indigenous knowledge in terms of its um, governance value, the fact that it's tied to its, you know, justice systems and ethics systems and research methodologies and all these things that are, you know, bigger um, uh, than, you know, individual facts or observations on the land, right? That that That's an entire system of, of governance. So uh, one of the things that we started to think about was if you're going to incorporate Inuit knowledge into fisheries co-management, that actually means re-examining broader questions of, of governance around all of those same things, including research methods, um, including ethics and, and questions of sovereignty, right? Uh, and so I think that that larger kind of theoretical piece um, has, has implications for sort of how we will, how we should be thinking about structuring co-management in the future. Was that is interesting when I think about your chapter on values as well, because in that chapter you were getting at some of these broader uh, things that are not always considered in fisheries management. And when, when you reflect on that chapter, do you feel that there was a particular Inuit value that was predominant over all others? Or were there any 
contradictory values that were kind of in competition with each other or or do you think there is a, a good system of you know values that we can use as a guide going forward to use you know what knowledge in this fishery i think it's it's complicated uh because commercial fisheries are were in some ways sort of imposed on the people of Nunatsiavut um, by Moravian uh, settlers mostly. So coming in and, and sort of trying to impose a different type of economy on people and the land, which means that there's sort of a, a complicated relationship, I think, between um, Inuit and Nunatsiavut and um, commercial harvesting industries. Uh, the thing that that chapter found is that even if it was sort of something that was imposed on them, they have found ways of actually leveraging the industry to be able to uh, stay connected to their culture and sort of rejuvenate some of those values. So they use, you know, people are using fisheries to be able to get out on the land either by being out on vessels and doing observations and, and connecting that way or by funding um, in the off season their their travel onto the land and things like that that kind of allowed them to uh, continue being Inuit rather than having commercial fisheries take away something about being Inuit. Um, so it's, you know, it's complicated to talk about that, that tension between sort of the colonial um, commercial fisheries uh, concept and the kind of resilience and creativity that you know, we kind of display in how they used that industry. Um, and that's, so I think one of the values that came out of that paper was around how for a lot of the people that I spoke to, uh, and keeping in mind that I specifically spoke to commercial fishers and people who are invested in the industry. So this might not be a broader value, but that the commercial fisheries were actually connected to people's Inuit identity. They said, you know, we are a fisher people and this is um, how we continue to do that today. And so I think, yeah, you can see some of that kind of complicated um, space. That is interesting too. And I'm sure uh, while it's uh, while it's an actual commercial fishing activity, there's many other activities that people are using to access their marine environment as well. Whether that's subsistence salmon fishing or char fishing or duck hunting or seal hunting or on and on and on. So uh, I know for some fishermen that I know, being able to participate in uh, a commercial fishery is a bit of a breath of fresh air in a sense to be out there on the water and, and doing what they enjoy, enjoy doing. So when you come back now soon to present your results, will you be presenting any recommendations or guidance or advice or a how-to guide on how we get to that vision? <laughs> I don't have a how-to guide, unfortunately. I wish that I did. Um, part of the thing about looking 50 years in the future is that there's a lot of steps to get to that. Um, but I do think it would be nice to facilitate, um, now that people have had a little bit of space from it, uh, some thoughts for people on on what they think could kind of be first steps towards it. I think one of the, thing that, one of the things that was clear um, in the vision was that those sort of particular values and kind of guiding principles according to Labrador Inuit knowledge are not quite clear yet. So how we would implement um, Inuit knowledge into management is still kind of something that I think we need to figure out. And so a first potential step would be to think about um, some guiding principles uh, that we could rely on to uh, inform at least recommendations for management going forward. Nice. All right. Well, we certainly are looking forward to seeing you again soon. And it hasn't started to snow here yet, but we have lost <laughs> all the leaves on the trees. And uh, so what's next for you? you now that you uh, have your PhD done, what, what's your plans from here? Oh, gosh, I don't know. 
<laughs> it's such a hard question, taking it one <laughs> year at a time. But um, I'm right now, I'm uh, sort of continuing some work that I did for the new Nazi of a government um, around the Torngat area um, and helping with, with some work I did on the uh, Imafi Vut knowledge study um, early early on in my PhD days. Um, so I get to work uh, still in New Nazi of it. Um, I don't necessarily have any plans to stop working there. I think that I have, you know, relationships and, and interests and responsibilities to kind of continue as much of the work that I've been doing as possible. So. And I think people will appreciate that. It's always nice to see when the relationships are built for people to continue on and I think I have might have mentioned this to you a few times already over the years that living in the north is quite nice and the winter season <laughs> is is a great time of year and uh, maybe maybe it'll be for you at some point. But thank you so much for doing this and I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to add before we sign off, but uh, really... Uh, just want to give you a big congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me on the show. It was fun to talk about it with a little bit of space from it, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Take care. So that was my conversation with the new Dr. Rachel Cabman. I hope you enjoyed. And I hope that uh, when you're involved in co-management and you're thinking about Inuit knowledge or indigenous knowledge, please know that it's a lot more complex than ecology and biology and Inuit knowledge and indigenous knowledge also includes and can be comprehensive of what the indigenous futures may look like and I think this makes Rachel's research very innovative and I hope more research to come in the future by others will envision indigenous futures it was a, a really great experience thank you for listening and i'll put all of uh, the links to rachel's papers in the show notes and i'll uh, see you again really soon take care